wasn't it? Raheem? The attack. Hi guys and welcome back to Switch Up. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I was a PC gamer, so the name Techland is absolutely synonymous with my gaming roots. Games like the original Call of Juarez back in 2006 and the excellent Dead Island give you a glimpse of how they ended up with Dying Light in 2015. And each of these games represented an advancement of their Chrome engine, with Chrome Engine 6 being used for Dying Light. It also gave me hope as a proprietary engine is always more tweakable than one that you've had to adapt to because you know how to squeeze out every ounce of performance. We're going to take a look at the Nintendo Switch version. Chiefly, you'll get your frame rates as far as performance is concerned. We'll have a look at what sacrifices have been made, and we'll also look at anything that's Nintendo Switch exclusive. Has the Switch version turned out as right as brain, or is it undead on arrival? Terrible. Let's find out. The narrative centers around Kyle Crane, who's voice acted by Roger Craig Smith. Oh, fine. I'll just radio back and tell Rise that you wouldn't let me through. And you play an undercover GRE agent. He's been sent in to recover a stolen file pertaining to a potential cure. However, some of the components aren't finished yet, and it has the potential to be deadly. The first order of business for Crane is to ingratiate himself with the residents of the tower. This is the main human stronghold, the leader of whom, Harris Brecken, a prolific parkour instructor, must be won over by Crane. The narrative is surprisingly good, with you completing jobs for various different factions, but with many of the choices Crane finds himself faced with being very much in the grey area. Those who are bitten can be kept alive with a drug known as Antazin, which is also said to hold the secrets of a full cure. Story delivery feels very reminiscent to Ubisoft's Far Cry series. Antagonists are a touch generic, but Roger Craig Smith at least makes for a compelling main lead. The core gameplay then in this open world zombie survival is very much tied to its parkour mechanics. Clicking in the left stick you can sprint in any direction. There's a stamina system and the running mechanics feel really intuitive. By pressing the R bumper you can jump and cling onto a surface and launching yourself from a height whilst pressing the button at the right time allows you to absorb some of that impact and maintain that running flow. Every roof can be scaled, ledges can be shimmied across and once you get to grips with these mechanics you'll be effortlessly threading your way through the city jumping off of zombies shoulders before introducing that custom guitar weapon to the nearest undead face. <laughs> If you are a fellow loot hoover, you'll be delighted to hear that much of your time in Dying Light will be spent rifling through cupboards, searching old phone booths, and taking anything that isn't nailed down. Inventory management is quite straightforward with it being divided into a weapons area, a valuables section, and crafting components, with the latter being very intuitive. Once you've unlocked ingredients for a new recipe, this will show at the bottom of the screen, and then with one button press, you can see exactly what can be crafted currently. These range from custom weapons, the DLCs provided, unlocking several which were influenced from other games like Left 4 Dead, health kits, throwing stars, and weapon upgrades. As the title suggests, these upgrades can be applied to any of the weapons you've created, often increasing the damage or durability. Each weapon in the game will gradually degrade, and you'll be able to repair it a set number of times. Certain skills that you unlock will allow for weapons to degrade at a much slower rate, but within this world it was quite a sensible decision. Some weapons you create are massively powerful, so this system feels sensible and always keeps you on your toes. <laughs> They're not going to be breaking every few hits. This isn't Breath of the Wild, but you'll always be conscious of their durability and whether you want to engage that group of zombies or simply pass them by. On the subject of zombies, yes, the world is filled with different types, from those slow shuffling ones, a la classic Dawn of the Dead, to the 28 days later speedrunning variety, whose scream will send shivers down your spine. There are bloaters, hulking, rebar brandishing monstrosities, oh, and don't forget humans, but the worst of them all are the volatiles. These only tend to come out at night, and if you'll remember that scene where Will Smith walks into the building during I Am Legend, you'll know how these go. Not only are they incredibly fast, they're also terrifyingly strong, and if you find yourself out and about at night, well my advice would be don't. Get yourself to a safe house or bed as soon as possible and sleep. As you'd hope with an open world game, you can 
approach the combat in many different ways. You don't have to go loud, you can creep around, use silent items such as arrows to take out zombies from a distance, or avoid that combat altogether. Dying Light's RPG elements are reasonably well fleshed out. I love systems where you increase in a level simply by using that ability. And here, if you find yourself running a lot or engage in more melee combat, then expect your agility skill and your power to increase quicker than other areas. You can place single skill points and gradually improve so that you become more adept and eventually prograde in each of those areas. The skills add new ways of moving about the world, such as being able to slide under low areas or vault off the shoulders of a zombie to get past a large group. Dying Light does a really good job of logging all of your current activities and quests. You can set which ones you want active and also put custom markers on your mapping screen. It's nice to see Techland make the effort when it comes to including Switch specific features. Dying Light includes a decent implementation of HD rumble. You'll find gyroscopic aiming, which is used only when you're aiming down the sights of a weapon. However, this doesn't seem to work quite right when playing in handheld at the moment. And it is nice to see that you can use the map and menu screens using touch integration. Finally then, let's look at the co-op experience. Now, this isn't local co-op as in on your Nintendo Switch split screen. This is as in local LAN, with two players who own the game being able to connect over that local area network. Or you can simply jump into an online game. The matchmaking system is very good particularly when compared to some of the recent Switch releases I've seen. You can search by currently available servers, or just jump straight into a quick game. Your current progress won't be lost, however, if that person is behind where you're at, as I experienced, you may find yourself simply repeating some of the story content you've already done. Not a huge issue, and when you go back to your game, everything remains. Network latency seemed to be very good. I didn't experience any dropouts, and when stood on a bus, teabagging in unison while dressed as a ninja, I remember why these things are always more fun with a friend. End. And on the Switch version, there can be up to four of you playing in co-op. Dying Light is a very enjoyable experience. It's both incredibly fun and sometimes terrifying. But if you're new to it, I highly recommend it. And it scores 19 out of 20. The control choices are good. These are sometimes impacted by the performance and they score 16 out of 20. Onto visuals and performance, and Techland have done a reasonably good job. We'll jump straight into frame rates. These tend to stay 30 plus, however there are fluctuations. Sometimes people ask us why we always recommend developers lock out a frame rate, and Dying Light is a prime example. Generally, for 95% of your time, we're looking at 30 plus, but because it's fluctuating 30, 40, 30, you will feel those stutters. Had they simply locked this out to 30 with V-Sync, that's vertical synchronization, aka a set rate at which the frames are delivered to your screen, the whole experience would end up feeling much more smooth. In their defense, they may have done this to increase responsiveness. When you lock the frame rate and set VSync, you do introduce a small amount of on-screen latency. This may have been an issue for the first person experience, but perhaps setting it as a toggle option might have been the best way. As far as visual quality goes, Dying Light can look great, terrible, and somewhere in between. During cutscenes, invisible sliders crank up, improving lighting, texture quality, and that shadow draw distance. But when the cutscene ends, that's where you'll see the dynamic resolution scaling kick back in. Those shadows will drop down, and while not a bad experience, it's noticeably lower in quality. The world itself looks really nice and carries across surprisingly well. Most buildings can be entered and skipping from roof to roof felt reasonably fluid. I tried out one of the hardest areas for the frame rates, that being the large bridge with hundreds of zombies. And as you can see, it maintains a decent clip. While texture resolution takes a bit of a hit, load times are very good, usually within the 10 to 15 second range when transitioning into the tower. Certain areas perform better than others, but the overall visual experience is reasonably pleasant and more than playable. The developer include a number of visual filters if you want to use them, but also the ability to toggle on and off chromatic aberration as well as the film grain effect to suit your taste. There's a day and night cycle and also a number of different weather effects. When playing in handheld, consideration might be made to the size of the text. There isn't a text size option and the on-screen text when playing on a Switch Lite is a tiny bit too small. However, when you go into the menu, you can see a slightly larger version of this for your current objective. While the music and voice acting are decent, the real soundtrack here emanates from the cathartic dismemberment of the shuffling hordes, with x-ray cam slow-mo and your own internal panic as your overt 
moderately loud shenanigans cause a screen to rise and those runners to come flying in your direction. Visuals and performance scores 15 out of 20. It's impressive really the scale of the game and while there are a few areas of inconsistency and I really hope they lock out that frame rate, it runs well enough on the Switch. Audio particularly in handheld with a set of headphones is great. <laughs> bar a couple of wonky voice acting moments, audio scores 18 out of 20. When it comes to value then, Dying Light the Platinum Edition will set you back $49.99 or your regional equivalent. I haven't given this price in the UK because for some reason it hasn't shown up on the eShop yet. It's due to release on the 19th of October. This version, if you pick up the physical, includes a load of added extras. There's a map, there's a survival guide, lots of stickers, but all versions will include the following. Literally, the following. It's the expansion that adds a new chapter of the story. There's the Hell Raid mode, Cuisine and Cargo, which is two new quarantine zones that you can explore. The Bozak Horde, which includes a load of new challenges and difficult co-op gameplay. There's 17 different skins and everything Techland have added to the game since its launch. And it's a case of a developer maintaining a community by constantly listening to them and providing new content. In fact, at the end of 2019, there were over 17 million players. Not bad, two years after its launch. It doesn't escape Switch tax. You're looking at £34.99 for the same experience on Steam as far as content goes, but I still think there is an incredible amount of value here and it'll be hard for me to knock that down too much. If you're a physical collector, then I'm sure you'll be able to pick the game up for a little bit less. All things considered, I give value 16 out of 20. Here, in a city of lies, you are the biggest liar of them all. Decontamination process is finished. Overall, Dying Light on Switch is a pleasant surprise, but I had high hopes for Techland. Sure, performance could be tweaked, but it's still a miracle to be playing this in handheld. It gets a Switch Up score of 84%. Thanks to all of you. As I said, there won't be a sales video today. That will be on Monday. If you enjoy the content, then do consider sticking around. And a big thanks to our patrons. You guys are amazing. If you'd like to join them, I'll stick all the links down in the description. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it switch up. Cheers guys. See ya.